Welcome, friends of the planet, to a special edition of our interview of the week. This week, we're interviewing someone special to me. It's my daughter, Hannah Klein, who is the Selvin Family Fellow for the Equal Justice Works Foundation. And she's at the Brennan Center for Justice, where she works on ensuring that everyone has the ability to vote. And she's an expert in how to vote safely during the times of COVID. So we thought we would interview her today just to give you all some pointers and tips about how to ensure that you get a chance to vote and vote safely this election. So welcome, Hannah. Thanks for having me. I'm so excited to be here. Obviously, a longtime reader of ODP, lover of ODP, friend of the planet. So. so Hannah, tell us about how people can make sure they don't make simple mistakes that will keep them from being able to vote on election day. Like, what do you do if you forget your license, your driver's license, or any kind of ID on election day? Or how do you cast, say, a provisional ballot if you're not sure whether you're actually registered to vote in the place where you live? Yeah, it's a great question. This year, more than ever before, we're really urging people to make a voting plan. It's so critical that you are prepared ahead of time to cast your ballot. And that means knowing where you go to cast your ballot, when you can do that, what hours and what days, what you might need to cast your ballot, i.e. what type of identification or what other information you might be asked to provide at the polling place, and then how you're going to keep yourself safe. For all of those things, we really recommend that voters check two independent sources of information to make sure they have the right information that's guiding them and making all the decisions and getting prepared. So generally, we say that people should start by checking their county registrar or county elections officials website. Usually that's the place that has the most accurate and up-to-date information, and then double check the Secretary of State's office or any of the number of sort of nonpartisan voting tools that are out there. Um, there are a number of websites that can help you check all of this information, but check two different places because policies are changing really quickly because of the changes that are happening as a result of the pandemic. And this week, there's a potential hurricane in some of the states that are having early voting right now. So polling places are staying open later, things like that. So you want to make sure you have all the right information going in, you have a plan going in so that you don't forget your ID or you don't go to the wrong polling place or you don't show up when the polls have already closed or they haven't opened yet. But if you show up to your polling place and for whatever reason you have to cast a provisional ballot, that's okay. It's not ideal, but it's okay. If for whatever reason you're being told you can't vote a regular ballot on election day, you have a right by federal law to a provisional ballot and you should make sure that you get a provisional ballot to be able to vote. So what happens to that provisional ballot if you cast it? Well, after election day, Day, the election workers will go through the provisional ballots, compare it to the registration records, to any other information you provide on the physical ballot or the ballot envelope to make sure that if you are registered and for whatever reason you weren't able to cast a regular ballot, your provisional ballot counts just the same. If you haven't gotten your mail ballot and you're in a state that requires you to cast a provisional ballot, you should still go and cast that ballot. You have a right to cast that ballot just like anybody else and you absolutely should do that. But just know that it's not a sign that something's gone wrong if you're getting a provisional ballot at the polling place. That's how things should be going. And the rules vary state to state. So again, to go back to my first point, that's that's why it's really important to check your information and check it twice to make sure you're kind of prepared for what you might encounter at the polling place on election day. And I wanted to ask, part of being prepared is knowing what your rights are. And I think a lot of people get confused because what the rules yeah. are vary so much from state to state. Yeah. So if you're in line and you're on election day and the polls close and you're still waiting in line, what should you do? Do you have a right to, to stay and vote? And if you see something that's not quite right or there's an issue, what are the resources available to you on on election day to get some help for something that you see at your polling place? To answer your first question, if you are in line when the polls close, the polls are supposed to close at 8 p.m. and you get in line at 7.45 and you're still standing in line at 8 o'clock, you have a right to cast your ballot. You should absolutely stay in line. The only thing you should do is just stay in line, stay in line, stay in line, stay in line. As long as you're there, before the polls close, you have a right to cast your ballot and that polling place shouldn't close on you. The polling place should stay open until everyone who has gotten in line before the time that the polls closed has cast their ballots. Now, what happens if you show up at 7.59 and you're still waiting at 1 a.m.? or even 10 p.m. or you know, you've been waiting for three, four hours or there's some sort of problem while you're waiting, someone's harassing you or they say, oh, it doesn't matter that you are in line at 7.45, we're closing at eight, too bad, so sad, get lost. There are a number of voter protection services out there, but the civil rights community works with the National Election Protection Hotline. That number is 866 
our vote. So 866 our O U R vote B O T E. You can call that number. You can text that number. And if you have any problems, that's the place to call. It will connect you to volunteers who are staffing your state. So let's just say you're in Georgia, you get in line at 7 45, 8 o'clock. The poll worker says, get lost, too bad, so sad, no chance. You call 866 our vote. It will connect you to volunteer lawyers like myself, voting rights lawyers who've got experience in this field, who can either escalate your problem to someone who is trained to deal with a more complex problem, or if it's a simple question like, I'm not sure I'm registered here, can you help me check my registration? They can get you that information. You'll be able to get the help that you need. That's the organization I would recommend reaching out to if you have any problems on election day. I'll be staffing one of the hotlines. You might just get me on the phone. What about if you want to mail in a ballot and you got a ballot and it's now, you know, five days out, what do you recommend people do? Should they still mail their ballot? And what if they mailed their ballot yesterday or the day before, but they're worried for some reason that it didn't get there? Can they go cast a ballot again, which the president seemed to say you could do, but it sounds like you can't do because you can't vote twice. This is a really tough question. And I really think the answer depends on the state that you live in. The first thing I would do is just track your ballot and see kind of what the state of it is. One tool that's available to a lot of people in many, many states, for example, I'm a registered voter in New York and they have a great system that's available in my state is ballot tracking software. You order a package on Amazon and you wanna see when your package is coming, you go to amazon.com, you click on your order, you can track when your order is coming. You can do the exact same thing for your ballot in a lot of states. In New York, the way it works is you get a ballot confirmation number and you just go to the website, you put your confirmation number and your last name in, you click on it and it will tell you where your ballot is every step of the way. If you mailed your ballot earlier this week, one thing to be aware of when you're doing that is a number of states don't actually start counting ballots until election day. So you may see something like ballot received or ballot received valid. That's all fine. You shouldn't be worried if it doesn't say ballot counted if you live in a state where they're not counting until until election day because they can't count until election day. It's not like your vote isn't going to count. It just, they can't start counting it yet. If you have a mail ballot and you haven't returned it yet, a number of states allow you to return your ballot in person in either one location or at a drop box or at early voting locations. Again, I live in New York. In New York, you can return your mail ballot to any early voting location, not just the one you're registered at, but any early voting location. In some states, there are safe and secure drop boxes where you can go and drop your ballot off. In other states, uh, like in Texas, um, there's been some litigation about this, but basically what it's come down to is each county in Texas has one site where you can go drop your mail ballot off during the early voting period. So you can do that. If you have a mail ballot and you're worried about it getting back in time, which I think is a valid worry. I mean, I don't want to tell people absolutely under no circumstances should you mail your ballot, but I do think it's a valid concern. My strongest recommendation would be if you live in a state where you have access to a drop off or drop off location, do that instead of just going in person, because I think that will really limit the amount of stress that's placed on in-person voting, both during early voting and on election day. So if you already have that mail ballot, it's probably easier for you and it's easier for the election administrators for you to just fill that ballot out and then drop it back off. If you don't have a mail ballot, and you haven't voted yet, I think early voting is really the way to go. Most states have an early voting period that we're either in the middle of or reaching the tail end of. Early voting is a great option because, but for a certain period of time, you can come back another day if you show up and the line is too long, something's gone wrong, you can't wait for that long. If that happens and it's election day, you're staying in line. At least I hope you are because you don't have an, another backup option. I would say there are a lot of options for people this year. And do again, doing your research, having a plan, knowing what your options are is really critical. There's no reason that you should run out of options because there are lots of options this year. It's just about making sure you find the right option for you and you're able to execute that option in the time that we have left, which is six days. So everyone, if you can get out early, please do so. It's really important. But Hannah, one thing I wanted to ask, so we have our election during a global pandemic this year, which is an added challenge. And should people be worried about voting in person? What are some steps people can take if they are apprehensive about, you know, perhaps waiting in a long line to keep themselves safe on either election day or an early in-person voting? This is a really, really valid question. And I work at the Brennan Center. We, a few months ago, published alongside the infection Disease Society of America guidelines on healthy in-person voting. So if you want the full rundown of how polling places can keep voters safe, how voters can keep themselves safe, I'd strongly recommend you look at that. If you just Google Brennan Center healthy voting, it should be the first thing that pops up. So that's 
a longer resource, but I'll just kind of highlight some of the topics that we recommend. Primarily, it's just doing the things that you would otherwise do to keep yourself safe. Social distancing, good hand hygiene, wearing a mask. Those are really your key things. There's just a few other things I would add. First, a lot of times people are used to bringing extraneous family members, others with them to vote. I have gone with other members on this phone call, asked a ballot when I was, I was not old enough to do so. I think it's awesome that kids see the voting process up close. I think it's, it's great. And in other, any other year, I'd be the loudest voice in the room recommending it. This year, we really strongly advise people don't bring anyone that isn't going to actually show up to vote along with them to the polling place. We really want to limit the number of people who are waiting in line, who have to be in the polling place to just the folks who are casting ballots. And that's a little bit different this year than it is in years past. The other thing I would say is it can't hurt to bring some of your own supplies with you. You should check with your poll worker when you arrive if you can use those supplies. You don't want to break any rules, but it's always good to be prepared to have your own supplies. So for example, Often you'll have to sign in to a poll book to make sure that you, you know, you, they know that they have a record, you've shown up and voted, bring your own black ink pen. That way you don't have to touch the same pen that a lot of other people have touched. If you have an electronic voting machine where you touch the screen, can't hurt to bring a Q-tip or two with you to use to touch the screen so you don't have to physically touch the screen. You may also be voting in a place where they're providing some of these supplies to you. A lot of election workers we've talked to and election officials we've talked to have sort of prepared for this and are either providing Q-tips or wiping down the screens frequently, or it's good to have your own supplies just in case. But other than that, I would just say it's really important to wear a mask, not just out of precaution for yourself, but really out of respect for the election workers who have sacrificed their time and taken this risk to their health to make our elections run. Our elections don't run without election workers. I mean, they're literally the people who show up and, and make the elections happen, set up the polling places, staff the polling places. They're working from sun up to sundown. And particularly this year, they're taking pretty extraordinary risk to help our democracy function. And so wearing a mask isn't just about respecting yourself and keeping yourself safe. It's about keeping those folks safe. Bring hand sanitizer, use it. A lot of the polling places and election officials we've talked to are providing hand sanitizer, but you don't want to be dependent on someone else. It's better to have your own and bring your own with you. And then just keep your distance when you're waiting in line, try to keep your distance from other people inside the polling place, try to keep your distance just like you would if you went to a grocery store or anywhere else. The last thing I would say that I think is important to keep in mind this election cycle is if you show up to your polling place, there's a difference between long lines and long wait times. A long line is actually potentially a good sign. It may mean that, and hopefully it means that in the line, there's a lot of social distancing happening. People are keeping six feet distance between them. Inside the polling place, they're only letting so many people in, or hopefully they're keeping people waiting outside rather than having everyone wait inside because we know outside is safer than inside, right? So a long line isn't, isn't necessarily a bad thing. And if you show up and you see a long line, you shouldn't immediately assume, okay, well, I should just come back or I should just bail because the line is super long. I'm going to have to wait a really long time. On the other hand, long wait times are a problem and they are a sign that something is going wrong at your polling place. And again, this is my plug to call 866-HOUR-VOTE or text 866-HOUR-VOTE. If you get in line and you hear from other people, they've been waiting two, three hours. Some of that is the fact that we're seeing really high turnout this year, but it could also be that something is happening in your polling place that is wrong, that needs to be elevated to the proper authorities to be fixed, whether that's the check-in system has gone down or machines have gone out, power's out, they don't have enough paper ballots, whatever it is. Many of those problems can be solved and solved fairly quickly if they're escalated to the right authorities and escalated quickly. But once those problems start to happen and the breakdowns start to happen and they aren't reported and they aren't solved, it can only get worse. So again, I think it's really important when you show up and you see a long line from a distance, maybe ask the person in line in front of you or a few people in front of you, hey, how long have you been waiting? If they say, oh, the line looks long, but it's moving pretty quickly. It seems to be moving pretty quickly. I've been here for 20 minutes. Then get in line, stay in line. If the wait time is long, get in line and stay in line if you can, but also let others know. So call 866-OUR-VOTE, text 866-OUR-VOTE so that if there is a problem that needs to get resolved, the folks who need to get involved can get involved as quickly as possible. That's all such great advice. Thank you so much, Anne. I wanted to ask one kind of practical question. What if you're waiting in a very long line and you have to use the bathroom? Are you allowed to leave and come back? Can someone hold your spot for you? Like, how does that work? Again, I think the laws vary state to state, but generally I would say if you have to run to the bathroom, you can probably ask somebody to hold your spot for a few minutes and come back. I wouldn't ask somebody to hold your spot for like, 45 minutes. Like, 
I think if it's going to be a few minutes, you can probably hop out of line. But I would also say we are expecting to see some longer lines, both during early voting and on election day. So it's always good to come prepared. Snack, chair if you want it, book to read, podcast. phone charger. (laughs) There's a great TikTok of a woman who's like, I've got my fan. I've got my snacks. I've got my chair. I'm ready. Like, be like that woman. Like, just have it all and be ready. Best case scenario, you don't have to use any of it. But worst case scenario, you're there and you're not getting out of line and you're going to be able to cast your ballot and you'll be relatively comfortable while you wait. That's wonderful. Thank you so much for all that advice, Hannah. I think we've covered a lot. And if you have any other questions, Hannah listed some great voting resources and there are a lot of nonpartisan resources you can check too. So if you have any other questions, so much of this information is also online. Thanks for taking the time, Hannah. We really appreciate it. We know you're you're busy in the countdown. To I would never, away. ever, ever miss this for the world. I- <laughs> And I love what you guys are doing. I'm so happy, happy to be a part of it and (laughs) about voting, especially with two of my favorite ladies. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Thank you, Hannah. Thanks, Hannah.